The book itself is a uniquely Mississippi, excuse me, a uniquely Mississippian entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, some of you have asked how it came about. Uh, so I'll give you a quick thumbnail on that. Jacksonian Tim Medley had the vision for a book that would bring together the stories of Mississippi entrepreneurs. Tim, Paul Calhoun, David Martin, and Mike McRee, and Rowan Taylor uh, took the risk of forming a publishing company, Cat Island Books. The publishers went through a rigorous process to identify who they would choose to include in Mississippi Entrepreneurs. The 40 stories we had planned grew to 70 for two reasons. Mississippi has more successful entrepreneurs than anyone involved had imagined. And we still couldn't get all of the entrepreneurial standouts in the book. One thing that happens is when you talk to one, you learn about five others. Um, and the second thing is that we expanded the definition of an entrepreneur to include social and cultural entrepreneurs as well as business entrepreneurs because everybody here knows that we need entrepre entrepreneurial development in all three of those areas to create strong communities and a, a, develop a strong economy. So it grew like Topsy. My search for today through stories for common threads of wisdom reinforced my belief that Mississippi has a uniquely rich resource in its homegrown entrepreneurs. Tony Cooley, CEO of Systems Companies, articulated an overarching theme when she said, getting into the game and believing you can be a player is 99.9% .9 of achieving success. Every one of the enterprise creators and Mississippi entrepreneurs got into the game, and from here on out, I'll be channeling the wisdom that they embodied or shared. You'll be hearing from them. Shared traits. The first one I'm talking about is vision. Bobby Mahoney, in telling the story of legendary Mary Mahoney, the creative spirit behind Mary Mahoney's old fridge uh, house restaurant on the coast, said, you know what vision is? is seeing something that's not there. That's what happened to Dr. Aaron Shirley. One day, he was driving by the rundown shell of once thriving Jackson Mall, preoccupied with the problem of needing more space for the community health center he had planned. Dr. Shirley saw in the shopping center's decay the potential for what became Jackson Medical Mall, driven by his passion to provide access to quality, affordable health care for underserved people. Dr. Shirley's vision expanded to fill over 900,000 square feet, probably more by now, with health care and other services for underserved people. Uh, just so you know, uh, you'll hear about some of these people more than one time, but I'm just going to show the photos once, just in case you're wondering. In telling the ceasefire story, Humina says that back in the 1980s, when Jimmy and Wade Creekmore owned telephone companies in Meville and Louise, the brothers had the vision to see that cellular would be big. I think they were thinking of car phones at the time. Intercellular South, now C Spire. Betsy Bradley saw in an ugly parking lot adjacent to the Mississippi Museum of Art a vision for downtown's living room, now the art garden. John Evans had a vision for enriching cultural life in his hometown, Jackson, and founded Lemuria Books, a community institution. Richard and Lisa Holworth acted on a, whoops, acted on a similar vision for Oxford with square books. Philip Martin, who was chief of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, saw in an empty industrial park enterprises that would employ impoverished Choctaw Indians. You may not know this, but he founded 19 enterprises. Every one of the 85 entrepreneurs envisioned something that's not there to fill a need or solve a problem. Risk. Fred Weil, who's right over here, was ready to work those uniquely Mississippian hometown relationships to finance his capital intensive startup foundry. Southern Cast Products, but the local bank said that his plan was short on equity. He and his wife decided to risk it all, took out a second mortgage on their family's house, enlisted seven investors at 10,000 apiece, and borrowed 25,000 
from his parents. That was from the startup. Abdullah was chief chemist for EF Young Manufacturing Company Meridian when his wife, Farid Alala, said to him one evening in 1982 after dinner, what if we go into the hotel business? Lala responded, you must be out of your mind. She said, it's too late. I already purchased a hotel. <laughs> she had a yellow piece of paper. She'd signed an agreement and used all the money they had saved to do it. The Lala's risk with a, quote, totally worn out hotel catalyzed Lala Enterprises, which now encompasses multiple hotels and restaurants. Um, one more. Alan and Janice Eubanks report that the constant for Eubanks produce in Loosedale is a high level of risk, from hurricanes to market risk. Contracting with Walmart in 1997 to supply 80 big truck loads of watermelons, that's 160,000 watermelons, was the turning point for Eubanks produce. But that very year, they lost acres of those watermelons to heavy rain, saddling them with a big debt, but they stayed in the game. Judging from the risks they took, whether financial or entering a risky business, I think that most Mississippi entrepreneurs would say that embracing a level of risk leveraged their enterprises. Dr. Bill Cooley, there with his business partner, Tony Cooley, goes so far as to say, you must be a risk seeker. The ability to innovate is another one of the traits that tied them all together. And I really think that innovation and creativity, including creative problem solving, are twins. So I'm going to take those together. Um, Mike Sanders, also right over here, was motivated to, quote, help our farmer on his turn row and help him make money with the family's farm supplies and services business, Jimmy Sanders, Inc. I've known Mike and Nan Sanders, a force with the creative economy for a long time. But until I interviewed Mike, I didn't realize that his creative thinking about innovative technology solutions is what set Jimmy Sanders apart. In 2004, Mike launched OptiGrow, a web-based services that analyzes soil samples collected by a robotic sampler with GPS mobile software and helps farmers make good, cost-effective decisions. But Mike saw further. Five years later, he invested heavily in developing proprietary software that aggregates data across thousands of acres. We've got great people in Mississippi. Um, Nuno Aaron, for another marriage of creativity and innovation, go into the Mississippi Children's Museum and sit on one of those benches close to the door. Your kinetic energy will set off interactive light centers in the stylized lightning bolts, causing LED lights to flash. Artist Aaron Hain and Nuno Goncalves Ferrara merge art with science and technology, often in the creation of furniture. They do public art, too. But when McDonald's Corporation approached Nuno Aaron, about an interactive sparkle table for its design packages and stores all over the place, the creative duo partnered with a business team to help them scale up. Aaron says, it's wonderful to imagine how our creative economy could flourish if all the talented Mississippi artists had a clear idea of paths available to help scale their vision. Bill Bynum, CEO of Hope Enterprise Corporation, a, sober, a, a social entrepreneur, introduced a new mobile banking app that enables customers, especially in rural areas where there aren't uh, branches, to make wireless check deposits instead of going to commercial check cashers. So for some Mississippi entrepreneurs, innovation and creativity have shaped their startups, and for others, it's assured that they stay in the game. I'm sorry, I'm a little slow on the uptake there. Uh, one trait in particular overarches or ties together all the others. Mississippian Satnam Sethi lived as a refugee with his family in a 10 foot by 12 foot tent for six years after the 1947 partition of India. 
The bright, optimistic 10-year-old worked three jobs to help his family survive, earned one degree after another, eventually taught, eventually PhD from Oregon State, taught at Mississippi Valley, built a hospitality enterprise, Jackie's International, that employs 1,500 people. Dr. Sethi tells aspiring entrepreneurs to, quote, make sure that you have a burning desire for your goal. When I asked what was your burning desire, Dr. Sethi responded, to make money so that I could provide for my poor family in India. Passion. How many of you have dined in Jackson at Bravo or Broad Street Bakery or Sal and Mookie's New York Pizza and Ice Cream Joint, all founded by Chef Dan Blumenthal and Jeff Good? To attract desperately needed startup financing for Bravo, they presented a business plan, two years in the making, right? Um, to 750 people face-to-face, -face, hosting 250 people in small groups twice a week in Jeff's home to sample risotto, pasta, pizza. I mean, this was from the beginning. Uh, they persuaded 44 different people to invest $10,000 a piece in the venture, coming together for the 45th themselves. And the, the really smart thing on that was that it was a great marketing strategy, too. So that's passion. And many of, by the way, many of you heard Mary Peavy talk at breakfast this morning. Hardly Peavy had a passion to be a rock star. He was kicked out of several bands in Mississippi State, at which point he combined his passion for music with natural talent for visualizing and building things. Sorry, guys. Jeff and Dan. Whoops. Today, PV obviously is synonymous with amplifiers, guitars, and very large sound systems. Ed Meek, a serial entrepreneur and publisher of HottyToddy.com, channeled, channeled his passionate drive into a uniquely Mississippian brand of networking to create his amazingly successful nightclub and bar trade show in Las Vegas. Martha Bergmar, his passion to fulfill the promise of justice for all in America led her to found the Mississippi Center for Justice. So think about the role of passion. You know, a person is important. A person could have vision, the ability to innovate and solve problems creatively, and a willingness to take risks. Three of the four predominant traits, but without passion for the enterprise, how would an entrepreneur fuel the drive it takes to succeed? Mississippi entrepreneurs also articulate much of their collective wisdom. Jill Beneke, founder of Pillion Corporation, says, you need to develop a good business plan, but you can develop plans until you die. At some point, you have to step off the cliff and be prepared to pull the parachute. Jill did just that, and today she and her 30 engineers design unique IT solutions for every client. It's a great story. Get the book and read it. Bill Ho, founder of Valley Services, wrote a book full of his wisdom called How to Succeed at Success. The entrepreneur's collective wisdom tends to cluster in a number of areas, like the need to focus. Three guys who worked together at NASA's John C. Sinna Space Center near Bay St. Louis, Ernest Burdett, Robert Sandoz, and Frank Willow, founded Triton Systems, originally to do government contracting. As frustrations mounted, the partners, quote, hedged their bets by diversifying into everything we could think of, said Willem. They even had a bikini business that went bust. Then one morning, Burdett, came in and insisted that his two partners go see the movie City Slickers. Why? The whole point, said Willem, was the scene where Jack Palance, tough as nails cap boss, looks at Billy Crystal, New York City Slicker, and says, just one thing. That's what you have to find out. And that inspired him. The ensuing search for the one right thing led Triton Systems to its specialized focus in the ATM business. Oops. 
Before master innovator Joel Baumgart read Al Ree's book, Focus, he tried to diversify by developing two new products that drained resources, and according to Joel, the market didn't want them. Liza Lucer, founder of the CeeLo Agency, tells a similar tale. Liza's, quote, heart for small business led her to invest two years developing kind of a Google in the box product for small businesses that couldn't afford her services. But the speed of the internet overwhelmed the product. Liza says, you have to keep the main thing, the main thing with a company and look what she's done. It's really wonderful. Trends, Mississippi entrepreneurs stay in the game by watching trends. Kathy and Greg McDay, who had the local markets here in Jackson, say that listening to customers alerts them to trends. Greg reflected, our customers have enjoyed local Mississippi products for years, Kathy added. Now that locally grown has become a marketing trend, we're putting up signage to claim credit in their neighborhood markets. Mississippi entrepreneurs get it that savvy marketing has to move hand in hand with developing the next best thing. Will Primo, the turkey call maker who founded Primo Hunting, read radical marketing and decided not to have an advertising budget. Instead, Primo sold products to any dealer without burdensome credit requirements and wrote off bad credit to the advertising budget. That's creative thinking too, isn't it? <laughs> While CEO of SmartSync, Stephen Johnson watched revenues drop despite very bold internal moves. Then he enlisted a savvy chief marketing officer to quote, brand SmartSync globally as the leader in cellular-based smart grid communications and successfully launched a bold war in the marketplace and ended up with six years worth of business. Technology. Entrepreneurs in this cohort early on developed technological, adopted technological advances to give their businesses an edge. Hartley Peavy, Tommy Delaney, and Bill Seaman adopted CNC, computer, computer numerical control technology, to turn out guitars, structural steel, and fiberglass composites faster and with more precision. And we, of course, have an increasing number of great companies in the technology field with names like C Spire, Baumgar, Systems Company, SmartSync, now part of Itron, Pilium, Triton, Systems, Howard Industries, and just talking with people for the last two days, a lot of others. It's really exciting to see this happen. Our homegrown entrepreneurs have a lot to say about education and the workforce. They value uniquely strong traits of Mississippi workers. Marty Davidson of Southern Pipe and Supply says, our edge comes from our people. Fred Weil says, the work ethic in Mississippi gives us a competitive advantage. Hartley Peavy speaks of the Mississippi determination of his employees. But hiring employees with the right education and skills can present hurdles. Bill Seaman has trouble finding people with CNC expertise and says, Mississippi needs to help students understand there's a career path open to them. Stephen Johnson, whoops, sorry. Uh, Stephen Johnson reflected that his biggest challenge with SmartSync was hiring technology people fast enough to support our growth. Jill Beneke has a, a variation on hiring just the right kind of engineers. Uh, Tony Cooley, a tier one supplier to both Nissan and Toyota, speaks of the need to develop soft skills, things like showing up for work. Um, Joe Sanderson, John Palmer, Mary Peavy, Dick Maupas, Marty Davidson, it, actually have advice for aspiring entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs to get a liberal arts education at the undergraduate level so that you understand people, then specialize. B.T. Jones, whose business is education and training of young people, says what separates you from others is your ability to communicate. Luck, that's a big topic. Many of the entrepreneurs 
capitalized on Locke, both good and bad. Just a couple of concluding stories on Locke. Gail Pittman, after a 1988 trip abroad, had created a palette of colors from Italy for a new Tuscan-inspired collection of her pottery. A few months later, the president of the not yet completed Beau Rivage Casino flew Gail to Biloxi to see his La Cucina restaurant and said, we want to use your dishes. Pittman warned, our pottery isn't restaurant great, it will chip, it's expensive because it's hand painted. The casino president was undaunted. So Gail asked, how many pieces do you need? He answered, 10,000. Pittman replied, we can do that, no problem noting that her business partner was just about on the floor. <laughs> when does it open, Pittman asked. In six weeks, he said. It's home-style Italian, and we want sun-drenched Tuscan colors. So this was a classic case of luck happening when preparedness meets opportunity. The other luck story involves John Palmer, a master sliding into the curve. He recalled that when Skytel's predecessor company was applying for the cellular license in Los Angeles, which was a big deal, they were short a cell tower or an antenna in Palos Verdes. His friend at the Holiday Inn out there gave him an instant lease, and Jay Baggett, his chief engineer in Washington, D.C. at the time, walked into the FCC's engineering office, and it was closing, same day and persuaded the person there to, quote, spend a few minutes to add this one little site to our application. They ended up working till midnight and filed it. Palmer said, the FCC decided three to two, three to two in our favor and noted that MCCA had one more antenna site than the others. Talk about luck, said John. You know, I'm gonna add one more quick story there. I realize I, 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 I think it's also important for people who have bad luck to turn it into good. And uh, Robert St. John has an amazing story. When he was opening his first restaurant in Hattiesburg, the Purple Parrot, on opening night, his chef drank a case of beer and couldn't function. John had to take, I mean, sorry, Robert had to take over the kitchen. And he told me he, he, the last, the, the most he knew about cooking was from an easy bake oven that he got for Christmas when he was six years old. But if he hadn't had that bad luck, he, he, he really seriously got into chefing. He would not have become an award-winning chef and cookbook author and columnist and all the things that Robert has become. So turning bad luck into good is another good one. Um, there are plenty of action items from these stories and more in the book for entrepreneurs who stayed, about the entrepreneurs who stayed in the game, for those of you who, you who are now starting businesses. There are more in the book. Also, for those of you who are leaders in business, economic development, and government, use your own vision and creative problem-solving opportunities to help innovate Mississippi, make this state a place where startups and expansions can flourish. I have to tell you one more thing about Mississippi entrepreneurs. They're heavily reinvested in their communities and making the state a fertile ground for entrepreneurship. Just a quick sampling of what they're doing gives a sense of how important it is to increase this pool of entrepreneurial, philanthropic Mississippians. Ed and Becky Meek made a 5.3 million gift to the University of Mississippi to establish the Meek School of Journalism and New Media. Joe Sanderson has invested millions in education and health care, and now golf, but that connects back to hell. Uh, Jim Barksdale and family created the Barksdale Reading Institute. Tony and Bill Cooley created the Center for Social Enterprise and invest in Jackson Public Schools as well as Tougaloo College and Jackson State. Tommy Delaney, Marty Davidson, Linda and Billy Howard, the Sanders, their investments range from the arts to community colleges. Dr. Saiti supports a scholarship endowment at Millsaps and has personally paid tuition for college student every year since the 1970s. Chief Philip Martin plowed profits from his enterprises into a tribal scholarship program and lived to see over 500 of 8,500 plus enrolled members of the tribe earn college degrees. Um, some have created foundations and systematically support 
health, education, the arts, social justice, entrepreneurs like Dr. John Bauer, Phil Harden, Richard McRae, John Palmer, Baumgart, Tommy and Jim Dust, C Spire, and of course, Jack Reed Sr. and George McLean were among co-founders of Tupelo's CREATE. And I'm sure there are more foundations, and I think every single entrepreneur invests in ways I don't even know about in the communities. Many, probably most, uh, give up their time and business resources. For example, Johnny Terry mentors two or three young men every year. In 2008, he received the award for National Mentor of the Year from 100 Black Men of America. Chef, Chef Dan Blumenthal and Jeff Good support community events endlessly. Malcolm White regularly donates space at Howl and Mouse for charitable events. Robert St. John created Extra Table. It's absolutely endless. Mississippi's passionate entrepreneurs are surely one of our richest resources, and I think we should give them all a huge hand. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and, and supporting innovation in Mississippi. And Tony, if you would join me up here, uh, we want to move on to the, the next big thing. Thank you very much, Polly. And we're going to ask each of the uh, representatives or entrepreneurs here in the audience to stand. And if you could, please hold your applause till the end. Um, uh, if we, I'm just going to go down the list again, hold your applause to the end. Ms. Betsy Bradley, Mississippi Museum of Art. Uh, Ms. Jill Benicky, Pilium. Um, Dr. Bill Cooley, if he's here, and Tony Cooley, I know he's here with Systems Electric Coating. Uh, John Evans with Lemuria Bookstore. Uh, Jeff Good and Dan Blumenthal. Um, Aaron Hain and Nuno um, Gonclaviz uh, Fiera with Nuno Aaron. Stephen Johnston, former uh, president and CEO of SmartSync. Um, Abdul Lala, Lala Management, Liza Lucer, um, CELO Agency, uh, Ed Meek with Oxford Publishing, um, and I know Mary Peavy had to uh, uh, go to, to you know, health care for Hartley, but uh, Mr. Stan Pratt, the storyteller for Mr. Um, Bill Hogue, um, Mike Sanders and Ms. Nan Sanders, um, Monica Sethi Harrigal with Jackie's International, um, Dr. Ollie Shirley for, um, here on behalf of Dr. Aaron Shirley with, Medical, with the Jackson Medical Mall. Um, uh, Ms. Sita Srivastan, Srinivasan. Srinivasan, I'm sorry, completely blew that up. Thing. And uh, Fred Weil with Southern Cast Products. If we could please give them all a, a, a applause. 